Good evening. Good evening. I'm Chris Johnson. I direct the Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute here at the University of Utah, better known as the Ski Institute. And I want to welcome you to our second Ski X open house and to the to our keynote presentation this evening. <coughs> Welcome especially for people who are from outside of uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, who have uh, come here from all over the world as part of the Super <coughs> 2012 conference, and uh, welcome also the people from Utah. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Alan Kay, uh, one of our University of Utah alumnus, and he is one of the true innovators in computing. We were just talking uh, just now about there were fables about his dissertation when he was here as a graduate student, and uh, um, I was getting some clarification on what really happened. So he was one of David Evans' PhD students, and, and David Evans' view was that you, you needed to do first-class research in order to, to prove yourself and get your union card and move on to do interesting research. And uh, Alan was doing a lot of interesting research, and if you look at his dissertation, it includes hardware design, software design, network design, user interface design, and has some of the elements from which he was able to move on and do some fundamental research in object-oriented programming, in hardware design and interface design with the Dynabook, um, with, with uh, uh, computer engineered manufacturing, with many, many things that, uh, that uh, he has worked on since he left uh, the University of Utah. So along the way, he was at Xerox Park for about 10 years. Um, after that, he became Atari's chief scientist for three years. Uh, some of you may know that Nolan Bushnell was here uh, just last week, and uh, so we were able to hear about some of the times at, uh, at Atari from Nolan. Um, and about 10 years ago, he founded a nonprofit organization called Viewpoints Research Institute, in which he's uh, continuing his work on cognition and learning and uh, programming for, with children. Um, uh, Alan has received a number of awards, and maybe I should just note the uh, 2003 Turing Award uh, for his work in object-oriented programming and the, the creation of the Dynamo. So uh, please join me in welcoming Alan Kay. Thank you. So the aim of this talk <clears throat> is to give you a sense of what the research community was like um, from whence all of the stuff we today we have uh, came from. Um, this was suggested by Chris based on a a, uh, an essay I did um, in, as a tribute to the community when uh, several of us won the Draper Prize. And um, we all felt that somehow the community should be getting these awards. And I'll try and give you a sense of that because Utah, Salt, uh, University of Utah was part of that committee. Um, in uh, one of the Th Thornton Wilder plays, uh, he has an old uh, fortune teller one of these mechanical fortune tellers, and she says, I, I tell the future, it's easy, but telling the past is really hard. And the reason is, is the past is so detailed, um, and a lot of the details actually are important. And another part of it, as all of us discovered when we um, were asked to write histories some 20, 25 years ago, is that Many things uh, that, uh, many pathways are taken, are taken not just because some idea beckons, but also because one has been disgusted by um, work one sees around them. For instance, IBM back in those days was a constant source of in inspiration to do better. <laughs> and this makes, uh, uh, telling an honest history almost impossible because you can praise somebody in a sentence. So and so was great and we got some ideas from them, but when you uh, do the opposite of praising somebody who's saying this work was so bad that we decided to do this, 
you can't just do it in a sentence it's not fair you have to explain why and so the histories we all wound up writing omitted many of the uh, main motivations for some of the the things that we did but so first I'll give you a little outline of how this worked some of the people here I think are old enough to have been alive when when this stuff started and this slogan goes back to the World War II radar effort at MIT, Building 20 uh, radi Radiation Lab. And many people don't realize that radar was actually the technology that won World War II for us because we were in dan danger of going under from German U-boats. The British had invented more radar than we had. People were fooling around with it. And um, for a variety of reasons, they did not have the resources to develop it. So they came over not just <clears throat> with the ideas, but with the fundamental technology that made radar pract practical, which is a device called the cavity magnetron, <clears throat> and, <clears throat> and gave it to MIT. And if you think about World War II, remember December 7th, 1941 was in December. So 41 had already happened. So it was 42, 43, 44, and half of 45. So World War II was a big deal, but it was only three and a half years compared to what we're used to today of things that go on for a long time. And this group of people in Building 20 turned out more than 150 different radar systems invented, <coughs> engineered, packaged, and had them built by the Route 128 companies around Boston and installed on every kind of ground installation, sea-going and air-going vehicle. So it was one of the most amazing bursts of combining science and engineering uh, done in a short time to make things that actually <clears throat> actually work and were effective. And another somewhat similar effort was at Los Alamos working on the atomic bomb, although the atomic bomb was not nearly as critical to ending the war as, as radar was. So part of the, uh, both of these groups were funded by President Roosevelt's science advisor, Vannevar Bush. And Bush had been an MIT uh, engineering professor and had done some of the early analog computers. And so you can think of this as kind of an old boys club. It really was. <clears throat> and these were uh, pretty good old boys. They were basically gentlemen. And then right after World War II, we had the Cold War, and one of the big efforts there was to try and deal with threats of Russian uh, bombers. And so this incredible system called uh, semi-automated ground environment was made. Those are displays that those people are peering into there, and enormous uh, computers um, were built. And <clears throat> they were built by many of the same people, some of whom worked on the radar, were now sort of in more of an administrative past. For instance, Jerome Wiesner was an undergraduate at MIT during World War II, and later was a head of the Department of Engineering, then later became president of MIT, and then later President Kennedy's uh, science advisor. <clears throat> so these, uh, these things go on and on. Meanwhile, Bush, uh, uh, at, during the 50s, created uh, NSF in order to deal with a little bit more look ahead than we had in, in World War II. And in the 60s, um, ARPA, actually in the late 50s, ARPA was created because of Sputnik to do something about what was perceived as a great threat. and. I'll tell you a little bit about one division of it that was created in the early 60s called the Information Processing Techniques Office 
from which it's not an exaggeration to say most of the technology we have today got its initial funding. MIT was the first recipient, Carnegie Mellon, and in 1965, the University of Utah. So there are about 15 places, two-thirds of them universities, and about a third militarily defense-related companies like MITRE, RAND Corporation, Systems Development Corporation, and, and so forth. And these places created an enormous uh, number of inventions, and part of the inventions they created were PhDs. Over the six years or so this was operating, and those PhDs went in the 70s to Xerox Park and did personal computing as we know it today. So this is kind of an oversimplified capsule summary, but it's basically this idea of making progress is more important than anything else is something that was carried through in each one of these generations. It was the secret to making this work because, of course, being humans and anybody who's ever spent any time around a university and gone to faculty meetings knows all too well how easy it is for uh, people who have gotten awarded for being rational to be irrational in a meeting. And so, and of course there were rivalries in science and everything else, and the thing they decided in the Rad Lab was they didn't have time for any of that bullshit. So somebody, nobody knows who, came up with this idea. Hey, all we're, progress is the only thing we're interested in. Forget about everything else. That is all we're going to work on. That got passed into the 50s. It got passed into the 60s. That's what I learned when I came here into the ARPA projects here, and that was what was carried into Park. And the thing that none of the histories of these uh, efforts has really gotten clear enough, I believe, is why, why did they work? It was because the amount of cooperation that actually happened would be remarkable, I think, to almost anybody today. It's just hard to believe. Um, just how open, how everything was shared, and it was just part of the part of the deal. And so, the when you have cooperation amongst really smart people, then you get synergy that is out of this world. You can get 185 different radar systems in a couple of years. You can get. Uh, uh, nuclear fission in a couple of years. You can get enormous uh, computers the size of football fields running on vacuum tubes that never crashed in a couple of years. It's just unimaginable. And of course I can't tell you about all of it, but I'm just trying to get you into this era where the uh, we basically live in an era today where the components are really reliable and the people are less so. And back then it was exactly the opposite. The components are like the worst things you ever, if you, anybody here old enough to do vacuum tubes in the 50s? 60s. 60s, yeah. So it was just incredible doing that, but because everybody uh, cooperated in a way that is very difficult to explain, wonderful things happen. So, Here's a first exhibit here, and I'll direct your attention to where it says second floor there, and it says computer A and computer B. <laughs> and computer A is the size of a football field, and so is computer B. So that second floor is the size of two football fields. So it's about two acres of vacuum tube computer. Down below is all of the power and stuff for it up top. So when I <clears throat> when I visited one of these uh, in the I guess in the late 60s at Systems Development Corp, they took me into a room that was bigger than this, but it was like a typical glass house mainframe machine room and lots of noise and raised floor and all that stuff. And they said, "Well, what do you think?" And I said, well, I thought it was, somehow I thought it was larger than this. 
They said, well, you don't understand. This is just the console. <laughs> and, and they went over, this is just like out of a James Bond movie, they went over and pulled these drapes and down, and we were up on the third floor there, and you could look down onto these double football fields of um, the twin uh, Q32s there. And so there are wonderful uh, stories about uh, this machine. I'll just tell a couple. Um, first, first interesting one is the last one of these uh, did not go out of commission until the early 80s. And so some of you might be wondering, well, where did they get all these vacuum tubes from? Somebody knows. Tell us. Russia. Yes. Isn't this great? <laughs> yes. As these systems went on and on, we we ceased making ja uh, vacuum tubes. The Japanese ceased making vacuum. The Russians were still making vacuum tubes, so we started buying vacuum tubes from them in order to put into these uh, this defense system against them. <laughs> can't can't beat it. Uh, the other interesting thing was that um, because they didn't want the thing to crash, they did several things. One is they had two computers running the same computations and checking them. So they had a kind of a corpus callosum between them. But they also, uh, the, part of this huge room that was just the console were other computers whose job it was to do diagnostics on the big computers while they were running. And, Whenever they detected an instruction failing, they would patch in a subroutine that emulated that instruction that was made up from the instructions that were still working. So when one of these babies started crashing, it took like five or six days. It would just get slower and slower, and pretty soon it was almost all software patched in. There's maybe two or three instructions. And they always were able to fix these machines before they completely went went down in spite of the fact that uh, they would be having vacuum tubes going out every few minutes on these. And you could see the display screens um, that they had on them and that thing the guy is holding there is a light gun. So the way graphics was done in those days, the segments, they were actually plotted points. Uh, were plotted in sequence and the gun could register when it saw one and the computer knew when it drew that point and what it belonged to and would cause an interrupt and so forth. Okay, so that's from the 50s. So here's another thing from the 50s. This is John McCarthy as he looked back then. And John took one look at these Sage consoles and said, well, everybody's going to have one of those in their house before long. And so his idea was uh, because we've already got uh, elect electricity utilities, we've got water utilities, we've got gas utilities, why not an information utility? So that's what they called it back then. So this is a cloud idea the first time around. And so he started thinking about that. So he wrote this uh, memo in the late 50s to the provost at, uh, at MIT trying to get him interested in uh, uh, paying for uh, doing a time-sharing operating system for this new computer they were going to get from, from IBM. And one of the things he says in it, suppose that the programmer has a keyboard at the computer, then he can try his program, interrogate individu individual pieces of data or program to find an error, make a change in the source language, and try again. The ability to check out a program immediately after writing it saves still more time, and so on. Now, actually, if this were a history lesson about back then, instead of about Utah, I would show two other uh, pieces of writing that John did in the 50s also. One of them uh, called for an artificially intelligent agent to serve you through this terminal, and the other one uh, called for the invention of a programming language now called Lisp, um, in order to program this artificial intelligent agent. And John, by the way, was the guy who made up the term artificial intelligence. But it came actually from thinking about uh, what personal computing might be like in the future. This guy was smart. And even a few years before that, here's Dave Evans and Harry Husky. Dave was uh, an executive at Bendix. 
and at various times on this project he was a uh, a staff engineer and I think he wound up actually running this project but this uh, quite a few of these uh, I, I would call this a personal computer wouldn't you um, quite a few of these G15s were Harry Husky by the way had worked with Turing on the pilot ace in England uh, and later went to Berkeley with with Dave Evans so we not only had these acres size machines, we had people thinking about what does it mean to have your own machine. Okay, I'm going to pick the year 62 here, now that we're in the 60s, for a variety of reasons. First, it's 50 years ago this year, so that's a nice round number. Second, it's when I started programming. My first programming for money was on this machine, the uh, IBM 1401 maybe some 1401 programmers here. It was a bit of an odd machine, uh, to put it, put it mildly, but in many ways it was completely utilitarian in the purposes that IBM had put it out, which was to replace, without doing any psychological damage to anybody, these enormous uh, punch card accounting machine floors. That's what it was for. So you wrote programs to do what, in fact, you worked from the actual flow charts back then. I was in the Air Force doing this. So you think computing is mundane today? Well, it was mundane back then. And that's because there's just a lot of <coughs> mundane people in computing. And partly because business is so mundane. They never look into the future. They always want to find out what happened in the past. So they're constantly doing accounting instead of doing something like making probes into the future. But oh well. Okay, so that is our mundane slide. However, it is also the 50th birthday of what most of us think is the world's first real graphics system, first real personal computing system. And I've got a little movie here. I hope you can see it. Looks a little dim, but let's see. So the reason it's twinkling like that is it's plotting individual points. And to keep you from getting sick, they would be randomized in memory. So about half of this, this was done on one of these acre-sized machines. Notice it has a clipping ability. And if you notice, it straightened up that flange. Now it's going to straighten up these lines automatically for you. Now he's asking it to be collinear. So when he draws these lines, they're going to lay down right on top. So he's using those full lines he did as guidelines for these dashes. Now he's going to make the guidelines uh, transparent. He's got a hole in the flange. Sketchpad doesn't know anything about flanges or rivets. He's going to make a rivet to put in the flange here. And notice he can just sketch uh, without trying too hard. He's going to use that as the center for that arc because he can point at things and tell Sketchpad to solve a problem. Like make all those edges mutually perpendicular and there you see Sketchpad solve that problem. It's a nonlinear problem and can do many solutions. And of course he could constrain it so that uh, the edges are fractions of each other and so forth. So Sketchpad had three problem solvers. Could solve fairly complicated problems. Now here's another interesting thing. This is an instance of that master rivet that he just drew. You can see it can be rotated and scaled. He's going to lock it into the flange there. A little flick. And now he's going to show us he can make some more instances of those rivets. So this is the first object-oriented system that I know of. He forgot to get rid of these cross things, so he goes to the masters and makes them transparent, and so the rivets feel that change. 
and anything that he makes, he can make into a um, into a master. So he's made that into a master, and now he's going to make instances of that thing he just drew. Pretty cool, huh? So, what Sketchpad had here was real-time interaction. It had uh, masters and objects, which we call classes and objects. It had this powerful problem solver. So it was programmed not in terms of procedural programs, but in terms of what you wanted the results to be. And it could do some fairly hard problems like this bridge uh, problem here. Now the bridge is something we don't have a movie of because this acre size machine was so slow it would take the bridge about 30 seconds to solve and it was too slow to make a movie of. So in honor of, uh, I want to ask Ivan by the way, how could you, this is Ivan's, uh, Ivan's PhD thesis. I still think it's the greatest P single PhD thesis done in computing. And I said, H Ivan, how could you have possibly done the interactive graph? He had to program the display, for God's sakes. It was just, that's just an oscilloscope that's being used there. How could you have done that, the objects and the problem solvers, all by yourself in one year? And he said, well, I didn't know it was hard. <laughs> So in honor of, the, of this 50th birthday, uh, we, we actually have recreated Sketchpad here. So we have the twinkling here, and I can turn on gravity. And of course, my, my little Mac Pro here is thousands and thousands of times faster than the acre size machine back then. So watch what happens to, notice this little beam is saying it has zero stress and strain on it, but if I, if I drop it in here, notice that not only does it change, but the entire uh, simulation feels it. Similarly, I can do this here. And Sketchpad didn't know a darn thing about bridges, which is part of its charm, so I'll add on some weights here. And of course, uh, one of the things that this led to was the desire for nicer displays. And we certainly did. And of course, if you think about the, you know, looking for the keys under the lamp post instead of in the inconvenient dark place you lost them, when you're faced with something like Sketchpad, you could either make Sketchpad better, which means you're operating in Ivan's range, or you could make the display better. So virtually everybody in computing decided to make the displays better. So we have better looking display. Here's, <laughs> here it is in modern time. We can do a few, few more tricks here. So uh, for instance, uh, we can uh, say thanks, Ivan. <laughs> Words have weight. <laughs> and we did the... Uh, we did the constraint solving a little bit differently, but basically this whole bridge simulation just has three lines of code in it. And here they are. They're in the, the bottom weight there. Uh, the t top one here is uh, Galilean gravity, constant acceleration gravity. This is uh, the spring constant. So one way to, simple way to think about steel is that it is actually springy. If you've ever seen the Tacoma Narrows Bridge come down, uh, it's brought home right, right away. And so just uh, putting a vector sp string constant on every, every line in here will do it. And then this bottom guy is the pins that are holding the beams together. So if I get rid of the top guy here, gravity is turned off and this whole thing should settle down to zero because it's just being, being drawn by the string forces. Okay, so I'll turn it back on. 
And now we have to think about what will happen if I undo the pins. Okay, and this is just to make the point that what you see on the computer screen is just a costume. What's interesting is uh, what's down below, and we generally don't get to see what's down below. The costumes seem to have fixed purposes here, and I'm going to repurpose all of these beams uh, into the user interface of the system I'm giving this, this demo in. And I don't really like this steel look here, although Steve Jobs might like it, so we could try a different color here. That's too Microsoft-like. <laughs> um, and so this is, this is actually the system I'm giving this talk in. Here's the sketchpad thing. And this Turing slide here, I'll go back up to full screen here. This Turing slide here is to remind me to, to tell you that one of the things that was happening around this time was thinking about biology in computational terms and vi vice versa. Some of us had degrees in, in, uh, in biology and Turing was one of the first to work in both areas and some of us, I in fact read Turing's paper on morphogenesis before I read his paper on, uh, on Turing machines. And one of the interesting things about biology is the way systems work. So here's some ants and you notice when they wander into food there, they start putting out a perfume which starts diffusing. And when an ant wanders into the perfume and it doesn't have food, it goes immediately upstream and finds the food very efficiently and then goes downstream. So now all of the ants are occupied as though they've been programmed in some coordinated fashion. But in fact, they're all working independently. So this is highly parallel programming here organized by uh, sending messages. So we call this particles and fields. And it's something that works everywhere. There are people in, in the Ski X exhibit that are studying some of these, uh, how biological gradients work. And once you start thinking about computing, it is very, very difficult to not start thinking about the system's properties of biology. And this community that I'm telling you about uh, certainly did. Another thing that happened in 1962 was this machine, which is, since it has a display, is probably the first machine ever to have all the essential attributes of a personal computer. And the fun part of it is that this guy, Wes Clark, was the architect of the acre size machine that Ivan did Sketchpad on. And also did this one for biomedical engineers because they couldn't wait for the university mainframe. They want, he wanted to have something in the lab. And in fact, the first 20 of these were built by these biomedical technicians. Wes organized this, this machine into a kit. And in order to get one of these machines, you had to go to Lincoln Labs and prove you could build it. And that meant you could take care of it when you took it back. So by the way, about 2,000 of these Link machines were actually built and used in the, in the 60s. So this is not uh, onesies or twosies. Another thing that happened in 62 was the B5000 by Bob Barton came out. And this, <clears throat> this is still one of the most advanced pieces of hardware ever done, more advanced than any of the chips that we have in our uh, personal computers or iPads and stuff like that. This guy was a complete genius and we'll meet him again pretty soon. 1962 was when Engelbart sent his proposal into the DOD complex saying we need to augment human intellect and computers are the way to do it. And this is a great picture of him because he was very much a Moses wanting to lead the, the children of Israel out of uh, the darkness of Egypt. This was his personality. And then things got started, because they had already been started. And I think people who have studied the history of the Renaissance know that the Renaissance happened before the printing press. 
it antedated the printing press by 60 or 80 years. So that when the printing press happened, it happened in something that was already starting and it provided an enormous acceleration. And that's what happened here with Licklider. Licklider was a psychologist who'd gotten interested in computers and he said, uh, the destiny of computers is to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for all people, universally networked worldwide. Whenever they asked him what he was doing with this millions of dollars he had been given to pass out, this is what he would say. And here's a memo he wrote a year later in 63 to the members and the affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. They asked him, why are you calling it the Intergalactic Computer Network? And he said, well, engineers always do the minimum. <laughs> he says, I can't get them to realize that I want to uh, connect every person on the planet. So I've been calling it the Intergalactic Network to force them out of doing it the way AT&T might try to do it. And of course, we have that network today. He funded it. And here's a nice thing he said, if we succeed in making an intergalactic network, then our main problem will be learning to communicate with aliens. <laughs> and this, what's interesting about this is we gave him the first thing, but uh, computing has been terrible at giving him the second. Because aliens means not just communicating with other people, it means communicating with other software, it means software over here communicating with other software. Once you scale this thing up, you have an enormous uh, <clears throat> communications problem, which um, uh, most people have been afraid uh, to work on the last uh, 30 years. And another thing that Licklider decided was that you couldn't think of good goals inside the Beltway in Washington. So he said, I'm going to fund people, not projects. So these are some of the people that he funded. I just picked a few, here are a few that are recognizable here, Dave Evans and Bob Barton. Some people will recognize Butler. Lampson here, Engelbart, um, Ivan. But when I was putting, I was just doing these randomly, putting this slide together, I was thinking, wow, a lot of these people have actually won the, uh, the Turing Award, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize in Computing. And in fact, all of these this is just from the first five years. This is from up to about 1965. And quite a few more people who are funded by this uh, funding agency uh, have won it uh, since then. OK, so <laughs> this is a real picture. I will not tell you where it was taken. The sign there says, do not touch any of these wires. <laughs> And this is one of the most honest slides I've ever seen about how most people do things. Um, and of course, software is much worse. Because this might have only 10,000 wires and software has hundreds of millions of lines of code, which is tangled very much in this same way. And it's basically the tendency of humans to be tactical rather than strategic and to do things incrementally because it seems rational. You know, we won't do something radical. We'll just adapt what we've got. And that, doesn't that sound reasonable? Yeah, except it doesn't scale. And you wind up with this awful stuff here. And a simple way to characterize this uh, community that uh, Licklider was funding, these 15 universities and companies, was that they were exactly the opposite of the way IBM thought about doing things in almost every uh, respect. And, and it was also a much smaller group of people and they had much bigger ideas. And so in order to do that, you ha something has to give. And uh, basically they decided that they would give up on performance in order to get system integrity. And this, they didn't have a meeting to decide on this. It just it was the thing that was happening. I saw it happen when I was, when I was uh, here starting in 66. And so the way they would think about this uh, mess of wires is, wow, this is just a communications channel with everything that wants to be communicated with hung on it, period. 
that is what it is and we'll we'll make different kinds of these and this will give us all the crossbar combinations that we that you could possibly do but it'll be simple it just has the the problem if the first order is a little bit inefficient because the you have channel contention of one kind or another but this is just the way this group thought about things and this idea that this is a recursive idea that you can extend all the way down through all of the layers of software all the way outward through all of the layers of networking is something that was completely out of the way IBM and Burroughs and the other vendors thought at that time. So mid 60s here's Dave Evans at Berkeley and Butler Lampson one of the most brilliant people any of us have ever met. Um, it's frightening to realize that Butler wound up as being the principal investigator for ARPA on this project in 1965 when Dave left to come here. And in 1965, um, Butler was 22 years old. And he was always a senior. You know, Butler, from the moment he, he lit his eyes on a computer, he'd gotten a uh, high uh, honors degree in physics at Harvard and came out to Berkeley to study physics and went through the wrong door, as he put it, and found this project to do a, you know, a lightweight time-sharing system that could actually be practical. And he never came out of that room. And so this machine was called uh, Project Genie back there, but it became a commercial machine called the SDS940. And it actually launched the time-sharing industry because it was the only one that actually really worked uh, and gave very good value for what it cost. And it also was adopted by the ARPA community. So here's Engelbart now, a few years after his proposal, because Licklider funded him, giving this incredible demo uh, called the mother of all demos in 1968, in which pretty much everything that we have today, plus a few things that we don't have today, were shown. So this picture was taken back in those times and it could have been taken yesterday. Here's something we don't have in a good way yet which is screen sharing amongst uh, N people where everybody can interact at once and talk to each other with video that was shown in 1968 and it was done on this Project Genie machine. And of course the ARPANET was done right around then. So here's Khan and Surf, who later got the Turing Award for the internet, but they were heavily involved in, the, uh, in doing the ARPANET. University of Utah was one of the first few nodes here. It had this imp machine, which was invented by, guess who, Wes Clark again. How he has never gotten the Turing Award, I do not know, except they don't like hardware people. But uh, this imp was Wes's idea, and today we would call it a router. So the idea was uh, you need to have routers uh, because uh, they can figure things out. Uh, they can be independent of the different kinds of hardware that they're connected to and so forth. Uh, this is Lenny Kleinrock, as he was back then. Okay, and then Dave Evans came uh, here in 1965. I came in 66, so I'm just going to pick up my impressions. So the first time I saw Dave, he was wearing a polo shirt. Remember, this is in the days where everybody wore, you know, white shirts and ties. And I couldn't find a picture of Dave in his polo shirt. That's all he wore, except when he had, I guess when they took pictures of him, he put on it. <laughs> um, so he was uh, 44 back then. Um, looked like he was 25 or so and um, when I walked into his office he said take this and read it and what this was was Ivan Sutherland's thesis he had a big stack of them on his desk and the new graduate students had to uh, explain this to him the next day before they got a desk so and to me that was the biggest life changer I had because I really as a programmer for four or five years beforehand I really didn't know anything all I knew how to do is program a computer. And Sketchpad, as you saw, once you see it, you realize, oh, wait a minute. 
It's not that computers can do computer-like things. Computers can do anything. You can actually make a computer out of a computer that is not at all like the computer that it's on. That's what was interesting about Sketchpad. There was nothing about the TX2 that was remotely like the program that manifested Sketchpad. And that means something really incredibly important. Dave was, his, it was a bit of a ploy, I discovered later, but his, his basic idea was to be invisible. And this guy was the greatest motivator, the greatest make things happen around him person I've ever met. Um, I tried to learn from him. And uh, what was funny is he, he, unless he was in a really important stressful situation where he would grow like 10 feet tall, but I've only saw that happen a few times. The rest of the time he'd be sort of, well you remember Dave, right? So he'd be sort of chuckling and you kind of stammer a little bit and everything else. And meanwhile, things are just sort of happening kind of miraculously. Another great line he had when they were complaining about Barton to him, who is uh, quite a character, to put it mildly, he said to the fac rest of the faculty, we don't care if they're prima donnas as long as they can sing. So that was the end of that meeting. Talking about Ivan, he said, now there's a smart citizen. To the graduate students, don't wait until they publish, get on a plane. So I flew 140,000 air miles in my two and two years and three months as a graduate student here. Because he had travel budgets for all of his graduate students. And we were constantly traveling to both coasts. Not a lot was happening out in the middle of the country as far as computing was happening. So we would go to both coasts and meet all the other graduate students, meet all the other principal investigators, and this friendliness and cooperation allowed us out here um, uh, hundreds of miles away from anything to participate fully in the ARPA community. And then a uh, fun thing was one day he said, we're almost out of money, got to go get some more. And so he took a couple of graduate students along to watch it happen. He would take us out. To, uh, when we went to the Pentagon and we could see what it meant to pitch somebody there for a few million bucks. Because he said, this is the real world. And uh, what Chris was talking about earlier, Dave said, well, a PhD is two years of world-class quality work. Um, if you're working on an easy project, you should finish. If you're working on a hard one, you don't have to. Just write up a progress report. And Ivan was once asked, well, what is a PhD thesis? And Ivan said, well, it's something that three people will sign. <laughs> okay, Barb Barton, completely opposite personality. Enormous man. Dave was little. Barton was enormous, kind of guy who wins push-up contests with Australians. And he was incredibly articulate, so he's kind of a left-wing version of William F. Buckley and very literate. He was extremely well-read. He was a mathematician. He did not like graduate students. <laughs> he was not really a professor. Dave, he was a computer designer at Burroughs and Dave convinced him to spend a few years uh, here. And so here come some of his quotes. One of his quotes of a quote that he loved, um, we should all share in the excitement of discovery without vain attempts to claim priority. That was this guy in spades. So you could, it was very hard to get him to talk about his own work. Systems programmers are high priests of a low cult. That's a good one. Then in the first class I taught with him, it was on advanced systems design and he came stomping into this class and had a sheet of paper in his hand and says a few things known about advanced system design. They're all written down on these papers. I expect you all to, to read them all and understand them completely. And then he said, but it is my job to firmly disabuse you, disabuse you of any fondly held notions you might have brought into this classroom. And so instead of teaching us, what he did is he destroyed us. So anything we believed in with regard to computing, he would knock it down. 
and we would bring up things that we believed in from his own work and he would knock that down. <laughs> so it was total destruction. And because he said, look, it's not a religion. And you, it's true that some of these things are useful, but you have to, you have to start from something like scratch and you have to admit these ideas carefully because they will actually rule your your life. So this is the best course I ever had in 20 some odd years of school because he did the, us the service that most professors won't do which is to make us actually bona fide practitioners and critics in the very field that we're in. Something to think about when you're teaching a class. And then this beautiful one which is used every, everywhere as a principle. The basic principle of recursive design is to make the parts have the same powers as the holes. And this works in nature, it works uh, in engineering, works in many different ways. So, so we had these two guys who were completely different. And by the way, when I showed up, I was graduate student number seven here. And uh, Dave and Bob were two out of the three professors we had here. So it's three professors and seven graduate students. And Dave had come here with some ARPA money because he thought um, instead of trying to solve the hidden line problem, you can sort of see what the hidden line problem is by looking on the scope there in back of John Warnock. There, as you draw the edges of things, uh, they show through. And the question is, is uh, what if you wanted the surfaces to act as though they're opaque? What do you have to do? And, it was basically an exponential problem uh, in the early 60s. Take minutes and minutes and minutes to just do a thing with a few hundred surfaces. So Dave was quite sure that continuous tone graphics using pixels on a bitmap screen would actually uh, solve the problem. Now I have to tell the, the story of John here. Um, so John uh, had a master's in mathematics and he was a very good programmer. And he was working as a staff programmer in uh, the Merrill Engineering, the computer center uh, on the 1108. He was doing like COBOL programs for scheduling classes and stuff like that. And uh, not trivial problems, but you know, he was, he was a workaday programmer. There, and one day, one of the graduate students from the 3D, official 3D project went into John's office to ask him about handling large arrays. And John said, well, how large an array? And, and the guy said, well, 300,000, because 300,000 pixels is, a, is about a 640 by 480. 300,000, that was a lot in those days. And John said, well, why do you want to do that? And, so in the middle of this explanation of, well, we're doing this with graphics, John thought of how to do it, really. How to really do it. And so he started, he wrote a Fortran program to produce these things. And this is one where the power of recursive design was to have the parts have the same power of the holes. It was a recursive descent program that turned an exponential problem into an n log n problem and he was the, I think the shortest graduate student we've ever had here at Utah because uh, he was promoted to be a graduate student for all of six weeks I believe and his thesis was I think probably the thought, shortest one still right 33 pages is like 25 pages of, of uh, prose telling well here's how I did it and here's nine pages of pictures proving I did it and that was it so, um, and of course that, the side story here, which John would never say, but it was because John had this breakthrough that Ivan was willing to come out here. And Ivan coming out here changed the entire course of what you, because it wasn't just one first class guy in Dave Evans. It was one of the towering geniuses our field has ever had, brought himself and all of his graduate students out here in mass. To, um, to make this department double, triple in size and uh, gain the stature that it did. And it was because of John's uh, breakthrough. And I did a few things here too. Uh, this was um, a project that 
Dave was kind of the main mentor on, I mean, I, Barton wasn't really a mentor. Um, but you could go out and drink beer with him. And um, so Barton actually had the attitude you have to have to do hard problems. That was what was tremendous about him. You just had to be like him and you could knock it off. And so another thing Dave did was he got his graduate students consulting jobs in industry. Anybody still do that here? And the reason he did it was he said, well, industry is the real world and graduate student is an unnatural state. And he paid us almost nothing. And I asked him, which I said, How, why are you paying us so little? He says, because I don't want you to stick around here as a graduate student. I want you to get that degree and get out of here. Um, so, so this was, um, so Dave took me out to meet Ed Cheadle at a company that probably no longer exists, but it was part of the Ling Tempco Vought complex called Memcor Montec out on the way to the, the airport. It was an aerospace company. And Cheadle was a roly-poly Texan who was a genius electrical engineer and he wanted to do a little desktop machine and we hit it off and so the result of that was this thing called the sketch machine, it's a flex machine, and you can see its self-portrait, uh, what it looked like on its own display. The actual prototype looked like that and it had multiple clipping windows, it had the first uh, object-oriented uh, user interface and operating system. It had an iconic GUI, so it had a lot of the elements of, that we're familiar with today. And it actually kind of, in 68, 69, it looked a little bit like uh, the Apple computers of 10 years later. It looked a little bit like an Apple II there. So we did that and then after one of these trips to talk to Seymour Papert who was working with children, I started thinking about children's computers and what was cool about the flex machine is you could count the transistors in it. And so I was thinking on the plane ride back, wow, I wonder if you could actually make something that children could carry around because you don't want them, children to be sitting at a desk. So I started, so I sketched this cartoon of two children um, playing a game of space war which they programmed themselves on uh, wireless networked tablets. And after I got back here to Utah, I made this cardboard model and made it hollow so I could fill it up with lead shotgun pellets to see how heavy you could make it before. This is too heavy, by the way. We knew that back then. So the, the deal was uh, about a kilogram uh, is where you like to be with the thing and four pounds is the absolute max that anybody could stand. Of course, you know, these six pounders have been around for a long time and part of the strength of this was another visit that I took to the can't really see that very well because the, the projector is blooming, but that is an inch square flat screen display from 1968. And um, now how did we come to see that? Well, there was an ARPA contractors meeting at uh, Alta, uh, Alta Lodge in 68. And Dave, is, of course, took his graduate students along to this on the ground uh, as long as we didn't say anything. So we got to watch all of the leaders of the this powerful computing community dealing with each other. Dave, was, Dave wanted us to see how the politics worked and so this is all very interesting. All the stars were there and at the end of it uh, Bob Taylor who was the funder at, at that time asked us graduate students who were sitting in a ring around the, the back of all of these famous people if we had any comments. And John Warnock raised his hand and said, well, you know, we actually do all the work and we, we're, we're getting our PhDs and so we're getting out in the world and, um, you know, we do cooperate with each other and everything and don't you think there should be something like this uh, principal investigators meeting for our graduate students. And Taylor said, yes, we'll do it this summer. 
And so that led to many years of these where the top two graduate students from each place were chosen to go to Illinois uh, to their uh, where they did a conf had a conference center for the university there and spend five days showing each other what they were doing and forging bonds that left. So this is what that community was like. And during that, we went uh, on a field trip to the University of Illinois, and here was this first inch square flat screen plasma panel. And so you can see that once you decide you want to do a computer that can be carried around, and you know how many transistors a desktop computer has, and you know what Moore's Law is, that things are going to get better over time, then you can ask yourself, when is it going to be that I can put those transistors on the back of a display and now I will have a tablet? And the answer uh, in 68 was, yeah, probably around 1980. And that was a good, uh, good answer because there's an immense amount of design and invention that had to be done to uh, to do the software and the user interface to make uh, these ideas work. Okay, so now we're into the 70s and many of these people that you've met wound up going to Xerox Park. Why? Because the US government in its bumbling ways of doing things responded to some of the protests about the Vietnam War by curtailing all government funding on campus including, including the benign ARPA funding. That's when the D was put on ARPA to make it DARPA, and they've never been the same since. And Taylor, who saw what that was going to mean, gathered up his favorite graduate students now who had PhDs and said, we've got to finish this off. And so he found Xerox, who was willing to take us on for a few years to do it. And so in a, in a few years, four years at Xerox, we had this thing. Uh, so this is in 1973 here, uh, like a Macintosh of 1988 or 1989. Here's the GUI, um, desktop publishing, WYSIWYG, what we call uh, real OOP these days, PostScript, page a second laser printer, Ethernet, peer peer and client server, and about 50% of the internet. We were on the internet committee and so this all cost in today's dollars about 10 million dollars a year so pretty much any place could do it was done by a grand total of about 30 people right so this is cheap gotta have the right 30 gotta have the right process we had a legal agreement with Xerox that they could not interfere with our research in any way for five years we had to use that legal agreement because, of course, they thought they had ideas also. <laughs> and here's the interesting thing. Xerox made a, a factor of uh, 300 on their total investment in Xerox Park just from the laser printer alone. So contrary to the urban legend, which is not true, that Xerox didn't make anything, they paid for Park hundreds of times over, made billions of dollars from the laser printer. They missed the other things, but still a return on investment of uh, you know, 30,000% is pretty good, I'm told. <laughs> the other thing to realize from the standpoint of the U.S. and the world, the return to date from Xerox Park is in excess of $33 trillion. It's in excess of a trillion dollars a year still just from these inventions. And uh, so an interesting thing to contemplate is how come no government no uh, uh, university, no country, no company will put out that $10 million to fund this way. It's a thing to think about. Okay, so let's pass out some hero awards here. So first, mentoring. Of course, Ivan was everything. Ivan was a mentor. He was the second funder of ARPA. Um, he was one of the greatest scientists we've had. These are the mentors who made a difference at uh, uh, Utah in the early days and we give Dave Evans the main award because it was his personality that allowed everything else to function. He could deal, he loved crazy people. 
he knew exactly how to deal with them and to keep other people from going nuts because there are crazy people around. So he cannot be helped thank too much and I tell you if any of his if he wanted to cross fire any of his graduate students would lie down in it for him. And I'm not kidding. And the grand awards here are the funding and the funders. These are the four funders of uh, the ARPA community. Licklider, Sutherland, Bob Taylor, and Larry Roberts. Um, the guys who get the main awards were both psychologists. Taylor did both, uh, funded the uh, ARPANET, and also was the guy who set up Xerox Park. And I believe that the difference between now and then is as simple as the difference between how funding is done. The funding then attracted a particular type of people. Those people are still around today, but there, there's a complete mismatch between them and the funding. So those people are going into something else uh, other than computing. I myself would not go into computing today if I were 25. It's almost impossible to go to a university and even find out that it's neat because it's so intertwined, it's been so invaded by IBMism, but now in the form of Microsoft and web programming and everything else. So there's been a complete confusion between what it means to be a vocational person in computing and what it means to actually get an education in it. And the universities have been generally the, the biggest uh, uh, sinners in that because universities, with, when the baby boom came along, pretty much turned themselves into businesses which they pretty much are today. Okay, a little joke. Well, I'm not going to do the joke. I'm just going to put those up as an enigmatic <laughs> thing here because I think uh, this is a good time to pause for any questions you might have because I've done, I've done a bit, just about an hour and I think that's all I should, should do here. I'll leave the joke until later. Uh, so any questions on um, this talk which is mostly about why I think things worked and why I don't think they work as well today. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. I have a few questions before the reception. Yes, sir. Did the ARPANET help to cross-fertilize these ideas at Utah with others and other places in ways that were interesting that made things happen? Yes. Yeah, so, um, so did the ARPANET cross-fertilize ideas? Yes, and uh, interestingly, uh, just as much before it was built as afterwards. Because it was these several of these large projects um, that required cooperation between these uh, uh, 15 places uh, got a lot of the cross-fertilization happening in doing the planning. And it took some years before the ARPANET was actually as you, you know, um, email uh, existed before we had networks. It existed on the time-sharing systems of the 60s and uh, Everybody was very, very happy to be, be able to have uh, a working email system that linked uh, colleagues together. And so the, but I think that the, you know, for instance, FTP file sharing and other kinds of things were done after the advent of the, the ARPANET, which is really an experiment in uh, adaptive packet switching. In many ways, the ARPANET was a little bit more interesting than the way the internet does it because it actually, uh, it did, the ARPANET actually thought to a certain extent. So there's a lot of fun uh, working. M many of us, like I was on the ARPANET committee, so I was one of many graduate students who served on that. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Which device comes closest to your original vision of the well, I think the, the you know, I was w willing to settle for less hardware-wise than we have today, but to me, to me, the Dynabook was always a service idea. This is something most people have, still have a hard time understanding about computing, because 
they, you know, we still uh, place a lot of value in atoms. It's hard to actually monetize things unless uh, you get something in the mail, right? Or you find a, a very low price for it because we don't know how to value those things. In fact, computers are actually undervalued as far as I'm concerned. The average American car costs 28500 and I would pay that in a flash for $28,500 worth of computing in a box like this rather than 2K. Right? But most people don't use the computer for anything useful. It's just, no, it's true because people, almost everybody uses the computer almost all the time as a convenience for uh, dealing with old media. Hardly anybody of the billions who use computer uh, learns about new things by writing simulations, for example. So nothing even remotely resembling a computer literacy exists. So this is, ba this is still the Gutenberg Bible imitating uh, the um, fonts and lig ligatures that the monks did. And a good way to think about computers is to think about services. So there are actually three physical forms I came up with for the Dynabook. They were rather different from each other based on things that were going on. But the, you know, most of the thinking I did about it was what services. And part of the service idea is what kind of user interface do you actually have to have to uh, help people rather than hinder them. And it took us a while at Xerox Park to come up with one that was even halfway decent. That's the one that's used today. And, and it was really a much better user interface for children than it, than it has been for adults, I think. Yeah, so if you look at the services provided by something like an iPad, they're terrible. Right, because it violates the first principle of personal computing, which is symmetric creation with consumption. So that was one of the, if you notice in Sketchpad, you could present somebody with a working bridge or you could make one. And Microsoft Word, which was originally done at Park, you could present somebody with a document and you could read it or you could make a document. But no such symmetry exists on the iPad. The a iPad, most of the stuff that Apple has been doing are uh, consumer consumption devices. And I think they're terrible for people because they've com completely gotten people, they found the right price so that people will buy an app for whatever it is rather than uh, improving things enough so that they can make uh, tools as they need them. Right, so that's anti what this whole romance of personal computing was about from this group. Yeah, so, and you know, whenever you make something, whenever you make a tool, you're, you're simultaneously making an amplifier and a prosthetic. Car amplifies us in one way, but it uh, withers our body in another. We have to ch choose to exercise once we take on a car. And Socrates, uh, you know, complained about writing that it takes away the need to remember things. And, of course, this was Plato being ironic because Plato was the, one of the first great writers of all time. And he used Socrates as his mouthpiece. So I'm sure he was chuckling like mad while he was, while he was writing this. And he didn't say it, but anybody with a brain would realize, oh, but wait a minute, I don't have to give up my memory just because I've got writing now. I've actually got the best of both worlds providing I decide to remember. Because I certainly don't want to leave anything interesting out in a manuscript, right? It's too inefficient. It's too inefficient to try and find things when you need them on this thing. So you might as well, when you learn how to read, you might as well learn how to remember. And now you're really powerful because reading is many times more efficient than uh, oral transmission and if you can remember you're now putting enormous amounts of stuff that can work with each other inside your head. So that was, so this, these are the kinds of thinking that we were doing back, back then. Maybe one more question? Yes sir. You mused um, about um, how it only cost 10 million dollars to produce what parts produce. In today's money. In today's money. 
and why no government or company would be interested in that. And I think you've given us the answer of what they should do in terms of what you described. But why do you think they aren't doing it? What are the barriers that need to be overcome to recreate? Well, it's, you know, I've often wondered how, how much of a simple generalization you can make and get away with on, on this. But one thing that is certainly true um, one contrast that is really noticeable is that today's funders, like the funders in the past, are responsible. They have this money. But uh, today's funders confuse uh, being responsible with the need to control. And the funders in the past absolutely did not. That's so. Licklider didn't control a darn thing. His idea was, in fact, so a good Licklider story is uh, they asked him uh, about failure. Isn't he worried? Because if, if you looked at what these different projects were trying to do, they were cosmic. Every one of the things had not, there was nothing like them that had actually been done before. So pretty much, a, you know, it was artificial intelligence. It was making a network that was, could uh, scale by 10, 12 orders of magnitude without breaking. You know, nobody had done anything like that. And Licklider said, well, we're not playing golf. We're losing a stroke as a, as a tragedy. So this is more like baseball. And Ty, Ty Cobb had the best lifetime batting average, and it was 367. So two thirds out of the time, uh, you know, something uh, not good happened when Ty Cobb went to the plate. And if you look at most of the assessment systems that are set up now by Congress and in businesses, people who fail two thirds of the time are gotten rid of. But in sports, they understand what the deal is. And Licklider said, "Look, if we if we're 30 or 40 percent successful." on what we're funding, just that will change the entire world. And they said, well, what about the 60 or 70 percent? I said, well, that's just the cost of doing business in research. And this is what people don't understand. Because this is a phrase that businesses do have for various ephemeral things, like advertising. But they've never been able to apply it to uh, what long-range research does. And long-range research has been incredibly fruitful. But uh, another reason you could say is down deep, these people don't want to fund anything they don't understand. Right? And that is a disaster because it's not their business to understand. That's what they're paying the scientists for. Their business is to f find the best people they can and give them the money and take the percentages on the results. If they do that well, uh, you'll always get multi trillion dollar returns on the thing. So there are a lot of different reasons that are somewhat similar. right? You can work them in different uh, directions. Part of it is uh, Congress was not a factor back then and partly because of Proxmire um, in the 70s and other things that have happened since Congress has inserted itself very, very deeply in uh, these affairs, including this turning ARPA into DARPA, which came with it congressional oversight that makes that requires DARPA to have goal-oriented proposals which means you have to you have to tell the funders what you're going to do ahead of time and that's not long-range re research long-range research is uh, the, res the funders are paying partly for problem finding so I've been working on NSF for the last few years to get them to say look you guys can't keep funding engineering proposals and getting it. You're not doing anything. You know, you're, you're keeping professors and graduate students alive, but the field is dying because nothing is happening. And it's not that these breakthroughs were all done just then and now there aren't any more breakthroughs and it's not that the people back then were any more special than they are today. Numerically, there are more people of the caliber of uh, Arpa and Xerox Park today than there were back then. I mean, the field is enormous. So there's more to draw from. And Jesus, the computing, just, just having um, lots of memories to work with is something that we would have died for 
back then. So, so there aren't. So this is like a Pogo. Bar you remember Pogo? He said we've met the enemy and they are us. This is one of these things where uh, this is the simplest proposition. And another thing that is astounding to me is that when they demand rationalization of these things. And I said, look, the best rationalization for investing is portfolio investing. It's proven mathematically that in portfolio investing, you have to invest some small percentage in uh, unvetted projects because you'll get ma the maximum return that way. And if you go to universities, you go to businesses, they learn this in MBA school, and they know it, yep, 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 but they won't do it. They want that small percent to go into their bottom line because they don't understand the... So it's, it has to do with the, the, dif the difference between, I think, the regular world and things that require talent like team sports. Right? Nobody's going to demand democracy in professional basketball. Right? You get the best, they pay millions for them, or professional baseball. And you're not looking for the same kind of person. You're, that's the whole point of a team. A team is a multifaceted diamond that is put together partly by the coach and partly by the, the way the players work off. And the whole point is to get synergy. So it's not about having a, a party line or a religion. It's not about any of these things that make people feel comfortable. You know, and the, as Licklider said, you know, we, we don't worry, but like a Park, Taylor was asked, well, isn't this going to be expensive? And, and Taylor said, no, because I'm not going to hire any good person. And Zurich said, what? And he said, no, because you can't concatenate good p people to do what a great person can do. He says, I'm only going to hire great people, and there aren't that many of them, so the budget is limited. But he says, once I have these people, I don't have to have a management structure with these people because these people already know what they want to do. So Taylor said, my job at Xerox Park is to set up the social conditions so when these lone wolves need to cooperate with each other, they will. That was what his job was. He never gave us a, dire a directive or a suggestion on any goal we should work on. But he worked on the ecology of the system. That was his role in the thing. Butler was the brilliant Oppenheimer we had. My group was the lunatic fringe, as it was called. <laughs> and, and we didn't have a party line on the, on the thing. And we did cooperate when, the, when that was a good idea. And it was powerful. Like two dozen people, you know, we just did a lot of things in four years. And people are amazed at it. And I said, no, it was, that was the easiest thing we ever did in our life. It's the one time we ever got to work without interference from people who don't know what they're doing. So that's the, that's the hell of it. This stuff is really easy to pull off if you don't have all these side conditions that wind up uh, killing things before they ever get started. All right, we'll uh, end on that. <laughs>